check out a video together so you guys can go ahead and take a seat but just want to encourage the men in the room to really just lean in 
over these next few moments. I've always wanted to do that, Grant. Action. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Does Matt have like a catchphrase or something that he always says? Like every day. <laughs> yes. He says bussin'. Is bussin' a bad word? No. I think it was. I don't know. Slime ties when you're fav and hun. Yeah, it's like, I don't know. He tries to be weird. He's very brave. Mm. Confident. Yeah, and he's a prankster, too. Mm. He's always there to make us laugh with, like, not funny dad jokes. <laughs> he gives us ice cream at graders. A couple times a week. <laughs> Maybe three. <laughs> they know us by name. <laughs> He sprayed like the whole office was fart spray one time. I did do that. I love how supportive he is of me all the time. Like anytime I'm at a track meet or a volleyball game, he's always on the sidelines cheering me on. Every day he uh, takes time out of his day to ask me how, how mine is. He always found a solution for my problems. For being very patient. <laughs> Can we about us? Christian, what do you love most about your dad? how he's always led by example. He's 100% at everything. He is a good dad at my life. There's nothing but better than that. He gets the whole family to pray nightly. Uh, there is a book that I love. So it's a dad writing to his son, and his son is a baby, and he tells him, it is your existence that I love you the most about. Just you being you and being present is my absolute incredible joy. Just to see the way that you've uh, handled, responded to the things in your life that you had no control over uh, makes me proud of you. Sacrificing time, energy, emotions causes me to um, really forget about me. He, he has taught me more than I could possibly have taught him. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. All I can do is just try to be my, be my best and just always be there for him. Love you. Love you. Love you, Dad. You're a great kiddo. Come here. Oh, I love you. Mila, te quiero mucho. I'm so glad we got to do this. Absolutely. You're the best. Love you.
breaks not my home You are, oh you are Death is not the end You are, and you are God, I thank you that you are a good father. You tell us in your word that you are a father to the fatherless. I know even as we celebrate fathers, there's a sense in which we all just need to be reminded that you are enough. You are enough of an example for all of us as fathers when we're just not quite sure what to do. You are enough of a father for those who maybe on this Father's Day, are aware of some need there, that you can fill that need. I, I just pray, God, that this weekend, as we celebrate fathers, we would honor you, that you would be our example, that we would go to you to meet our deepest needs, 
we'd go to you as our example. You are a loving Father, a gracious Father. You are kind and you are merciful, and we worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. <laughs> well, I remember when my mother-in-law asked the question, where are all the men? The fact that I was in the room should tell you something. <laughs> it was when my wife and I were first married, it was just getting to know her family a little bit better. She's from a small town in Kansas, and um, she grew up farmer's daughter, like she raised pigs, drove a combine, the whole thing, and, and I felt pretty out of place, especially in those early days. I've spent enough time in Kentucky now, I speak the language, I do okay when I go back, but, but at that time, not so much. And I remember on the Thanksgiving there, that first Thanksgiving going in and all the men, they were all wearing their camo. They were going, they were going out hunting after we had lunch. I, nobody told me. I didn't get the invite to do that. And I wore a dress shirt because it was Thanksgiving and someone referred to it as a blouse behind my back when I walked, <laughs> when I walked in the room. And, and then after lunch, I guess they left. I didn't even realize they had left, but they... The, the other men, they grabbed their guns and sprayed on some deer urine and they went out to hunt. The, some of the ladies, they went into the kitchen to make blackberry cobbler and I was just hanging out. My mother-in-law walked in from the other room into the kitchen, she said, where are all the men? And one of the ladies said, all the men are outside. I'm like, come on, I'm right here. Clearly not all the men are outside, all the men. I I have a message that I want to be for all the men on this Father's Day weekend, because I believe whether you are a hunting, flannel-loving, deer urine-wearing man, or whether you are an avid endorsement with a really impressive Pinterest page, God has a purpose for you. And specifically, I wanna talk to the men who are fathers, or one day hope to be fathers. It it seems like preaching on the potential influence and impact of of fathers would be an easy enough sermon for all of us to agree on. In fact, I would say that this sermon would have been easier to preach 15 years ago for me, and I'm gonna tell you the two reasons why. One is because 15 years ago, even though I was at that time a father of four, I felt like, oh, I got this. And now having raised four kids, my youngest is 18 and he just graduated from high school. We're getting ready to be empty nesters. That new season of life that we're in, I'm excited about it. My wife and I are excited about it. And yet it also seems to be a season where I'm a little bit more aware of things I wish I would have done differently. I think a lot of parents who are in this season get what I'm saying. You look back and you just realize some missed opportunities, a lack of consistency, wishing you would have been more intentional with that. There's just that dynamic. And so I know my kids, they'll all listen to this sermon and, and this weekend they'll all give me card, well, they'll text me at least, and they'll tell me, hey, thank you. And while I appreciate their kindness, and I'm grateful for their encouragement, I know the truth. I know there are a lot of things I wish I could have done different, a lot of things I would have, if I could do it over again, there's things I would have done. It makes this sermon a little harder to preach. The other reason this sermon can be hard to preach is because it's hard to assume anything these days. Like when the cultural ideology says that there are really no such thing as gender roles, that all that's just some sort of social construct, and suddenly you look around in the world and people question all these long, understood and accepted very simple and obvious truths and suddenly they can't be presumed, it makes it harder to talk about a sermon like this. Like, it would never have occurred to me 15 years ago that you would have to start a sermon on Father's Day by saying, hey, only men can be fathers. But how do you talk about what God's plan and purpose is for men as fathers if we, if we can't all just agree that men, only men are fathers? And so it's an interesting conversation to have today because you gotta start way back here. And so that's where we'll start. Genesis chapter one, very beginning, God says, here's how I want it to work. For men, for fathers, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So right at the beginning, there are two things God says. He says, hey, 
here's what's true of everyone. Everyone is made in my image and everyone is made male and female. Everyone has intrinsic worth. Doesn't matter how different someone is from you. Doesn't matter what their heritage is, their tradition is. It doesn't matter what their preferences are or the, their politics might be. They are image bearers of God. That means we love and respect and we honor. It, it means that we pray for and we bless. The, they, everyone is made to be an image bearer of God. And he says, he made, it says he made them male and female. Made, you made in the image of God and you've been made in male and female. So isn't that interesting? It's like the very first chapter of the Bible says, hey, these two things are true of people. They are image bearers of God and they are male and female. And, and so we shouldn't be surprised, I suppose, that these two most foundational truths of scripture in Genesis one that were established from the beginning are now the very things where there can be so much confusion. The very things where there's this um, controversy around it. And, and so we, we wanna be really clear. Image bearers of God, male and female. We, we have thousands of kids at camp this summer. Thousands of kids at camp this summer. And, and, and the kids at camp are gonna be hearing this message. Hey, you are an image bearer of God. You are male and female. He has made you this way. And he, here's what God said about you. You are, you are very good. You are very good. And having that foundational understanding shapes us as men and women, as fathers and mothers. Without it, there's just so much that, that just doesn't work. When Jesus in Matthew 19 was asked a question by the religious slash political leaders of his day about men and women, about marriage, divorce, they're trying to draw him into this argument. And what Jesus does in Matthew 19 is instead of getting drawn into this whole debate, he says to them, uh, haven't you read Genesis 1:27? Haven't you read in the beginning, God made them, male and female, in the image of God he created? Like, haven't you read that? Well, of course they had read that. Like they'd had it memorized since they were five. And Jesus says, what? why are we talking about this? Since you were five, you've known the truth about this. And so Jesus' response to all the, con like they were trying to ask him a question that would trap him, that would cause him, I mean, really, what they were trying to do was get Jesus canceled with this question. And Jesus just says, look, this is how it's been from the very beginning. God made them male and female in the image of God, he created them. Verse 15 of chapter two, God gives Adam as the man an assignment. God says, here's how I want things to work. After creating the garden, God says to the man, you're responsible for it. You're responsible for what I've created. The responsibility, man, is yours. Genesis chapter two, verse 15. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to keep it. Um, my friend, Brant Hansen, has written a book that I would recommend to all you men. It's called The Men We Need. If you don't like to read men, listen to the audio version. He does a great job on the audio version, but he points to this passage and he explains that Adam was given a title. And the title is uh, Keeper of the Garden. Keeper of the Garden. And the word keeper is an interesting word. It's in the Hebrew, it is shamar, and it could be translated as watchman of the garden, protector of the garden, cultivator of the garden. God created Adam and he says, here's your role. Here's how I want things to work. I created this, you're responsible for it. You are the keeper, the watcher, you're the protector of the garden. That's the way God wants things to work. A gardener protects. He protects the garden from weeds that could grow up to choke out the plants and trees. He protects the garden from predators that might try to sneak in and eat the plants or trample them down. He is the protector. And it's God's plan for men, especially fathers, to be protectors of the garden. I um, remember a number of years ago, I got this especially hateful email from somebody in, in church, somebody I didn't know. And it was hateful enough, it didn't really bother me. Like some, the ones that are way over the top, it's, it's okay. You know, then it's like, oh, 
this is a you problem, right? And so I got this, I got this especially hateful email, and I forwarded it on to my dad because he's been in ministry most of his life, and I thought, well, he'll get a kick out of this, and, and he'll help me keep perspective, and it's good to share those things with people. And, and so I, I sent it to my dad. About 10 minutes later, I received an email back from my dad. Actually, I re- he forwarded me an email that he had already sent to the guy who had sent me the email. And it was strongly worded. <laughs> my dad coming to my defense, putting this guy in his place. And honestly, I mean, I was a little, I was a little embarrassed. I can handle a bully. And, and I, I didn't really want my dad showing up at, at the playground to protect me. <laughs> <laughs> but I read what he said to me in the message he forwarded. Before, he forward, before I read the forwarded message that my dad sent the guy, my, my dad had said to me at the top, sorry, son, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> right, like, he, I, I just couldn't help it. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, there's that instinct to protect, and, and there's something within men that we recognize this, but we're not always sure what to do with that. And, and there's nothing more toxic or destructive to families or to kids or to wives when the one who's to be the protector becomes the predator. So much damage gets done because it is a violation of what God says, this, this is it. This is the responsibility, but we're not always sure how to do it. Protection, protection seems easier if we're picking up a sword and we're ready to, to fight and bleed for the person we love. But protector these days might mean coming home from work and checking your teenager's social media to make sure you know what's happening. Protector these days might mean protecting your middle schooler by refusing to say yes to Snapchat or TikTok even though all the friends have it. Protector these days might mean keeping a filter on all the devices in the home even though it's a pain to stay on top of. I heard one child safety expert, FBI expert said, it's certainly more dangerous to let your child spend the evening in their room on their phone with the door shut than to let them walk around the streets at night by themselves. Protection may mean working an extra job to pay the bills as you protect your children from poverty and from hunger. Protection may mean preparing your child so that they'll be ready for the threats and the dangers when you're not around. Protection certainly means that you're discipling your children now so they can resist cultural indoctrination later. Protection may mean having a direct conversation with the boy your daughter has been dating. When my middle daughter Morgan started dating her current husband, um, he knew, well she knew, so he knew that he needed to come talk to me. I have a little speech I give, full of awkward silence. And, and this, this one was a little different because when he came in the house, instead of asking to talk to me, instead of coming and saying, hey, can I, can I talk to you? He, he said, can I talk to you and your wife? And he said, in front of my wife. And, and so he wanted to talk to Desiree and I together and I never had this talk with the young man with my wife in the room, but okay, you know, that's fine. So I get into my talk. Hey, let me remind you that when you're dating my daughter, you're not just dating my daughter, but you're also likely dating someone else's future wife because let's be honest, she's probably not gonna marry you. <laughs> like that's part of my speech, you can use that if you want. At which point in the conversation, my wife interrupts. She says, Kyle, that is so mean. I'm like, oh my goodness. Why would you say that? And then she turns to him and that wasn't very nice. I'm sorry, just totally killed the vibe of the whole thing. (laughs) And of course they ended up getting married. And I do love them. But sometimes that's what protection looks like these days. A gardener is also the cultivator watering the plants, making sure the plants have nutrients. I Googled, because I didn't know the answer to the question intuitively, I Googled, what makes a great gardener? Number one answer, patience, patience. It takes a lot of patience to consistently cultivate a garden, believing that fruit will one day come. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good for at the right time, proper time, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. That, that's a father 
who's just gonna consistently plant and consistently water and consistently plant and consistently water. It's Justin reading Bible stories to his son before his son is able to speak. It's Eric singing worship songs in the car with his kids while running carpool. It's Jay kneeling down beside his son's bed every night to pray over him. It's Ronnie recording prayers and texting them to his teenage daughter. It's John taking a week off of work to take his daughter on a mission trip. It's Chris turning down a promotion at work so he doesn't have to travel as much and can coach his son's baseball team. It's Matt, a former college football player, who sees the fatherless boy down the road, grabs a football and asks him, do you wanna toss it around? It's just this consistent, intentional planting, nurturing. Adam's role was the keeper and the protector, but in Genesis three, there's a snake in the garden. God had given Adam and Eve one command, don't eat of this tree. Verse six says that the serpent came to tempt and says when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it and she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. So when Eve takes a bite of this fruit, sin enters the world. I mean, that's what it, it would seem, but here's what Romans 5.12 says, sin entered the world through one man. It doesn't say through one woman, even though Eve took the first bite, it says one man, why? because he's responsible. He is the protector, the keeper of the garden. Genesis chapter three, verse six, there's a, a phrase here that I want you to notice. It just says, she gave some to her husband. What's it say? Who was with her? He was there. But he was probably on his phone. <laughs> because he doesn't do anything. He doesn't say anything. He just, he just stands there. I know that there can be a fair amount of discouragement these days where it can feel like that's men. But let me tell you something. That's not a lot of the men I know. Like a lot of you would say, like, where, where, are, all, where, are, all, the, where are all the men who are responsible? Where are the men of God, the men of courage who will fight for the hearts of their wives and their children? Where are the men who are humble servants who are the watchmen and the protectors, the keepers of the garden. And I know some of you are in environments where you don't spend much time around men like that. I know some of you have been around men who are the opposite of these things. And so your heart is just very hard towards the whole idea. But I'm just telling you, I am around imperfect and broken men and fathers who are also passionate, intentional, purposeful, and accountable. I just made a list just off the top of my head so there'll be names I miss, but these are people I'm around on a weekly basis, almost weekly basis, who, who do this. And Brian and Greg and Mark and Michael and Murphy and Heath and James and Justin and Bryson and Matt and Eddie and Neil and Lucas and Carl, men like Harrison, Kerry, Brad, Corey, Patrick, Taylor, Chris, Tim, Steve, Jason, Brad, Doug, John, Tony, Ronnie, Brian, Eric, Rinder, Sam, Thomas, Matt, Brent, Trevor, Vince, Jeff, Kyle, Will, Wes, and, and the list just keeps going. Keepers of the garden. Warriors, protectors, not perfect, broken. Sometimes need lots of help and prayer, but are committed to it. God holds Adam responsible. Genesis three, verse nine, we read that God said, he came, he came looking for Adam and Eve and, and he says, calls out to the man, to the man, where are you? called out to the man, where are you? And Adam finally speaks, and instead of taking responsibility, he, he blames his wife. See, the word responsible just is the word here. At the beginning, God creates man, says you're responsible. Later, he needs to take responsibility, like that's the man thing to do. Just take responsibility. Instead, verse 11, who, God says to Adam, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Verse 12, the woman you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate it. 
Well, he doesn't just blame Eve, he blames God. He says, it's my wife, you know, the one that you gave me. And up to this point in the story, it is every man and every father I know. It's the same story. It is my story. It's a story of wanting to be protector and wanting to be keeper and, and wanting to be cultivator. It's a story of a man with good intentions, but then sin. Sin and we are inconsistent, and we are unintentional, and we are sometimes passive, and we're often prideful, and then it just becomes clear my way's not working, and what do I do with that? Because there are these regrets, and there's this guilt, and there's this shame, and so it becomes a game of hiding and blaming, and so the question is, what now? What do you do now? And on this Father's Day, we celebrate keepers of the garden, but we celebrate Jesus who allows us to step out of hiding in shame, who allows us to take responsibility, say, you know, there are a lot of things I wish I could do different. Allows, us, allows me to say to my kids on this Father's Day, hey, you all know how much I love you, but there are things I wish I, I could have done, do over. Plenty of times I see my way wasn't working, but I don't have to live in that cycle of shame and blame that because of Jesus, I can come out from hiding. Things don't have to keep being the way they've been. You don't have to be the same kind of father your father was. You, you can do things differently. I wanna end this message by inviting my dad, Ken, uh, to come out and share some of his story. Um, I'm incredibly thankful for my dad. I'm thankful for his integrity. I'm thankful for his humility. He has always been a cultivator and a protector. And even when I didn't want it, he's always done it. Um, I've asked him to share a little with you about his dad, my grandpa, and how he responded when he realized he wasn't, his way wasn't working. So would you please welcome my dad, Ken Eidelman. Well, I am really glad that we celebrate an annual Father's Day here in the life of our church. And it's not entirely because I'm the father of three and the grandfather of 11 and the great-grandfather of one as of eight months ago. It's much bigger than that. It's because I am convicted about the critical importance of godly men, fathers, leading Christ-centered families in this generation to be able to spiritually impact the generations yet to come. My own father, Kenneth Eidelman Sr., went to heaven in 2011 at the age of 94. Kyle and I and my two sons-in-law actually conducted his funeral celebration. And right now, I am thinking about my dad's life and how well it fits with the theme for our sermon series right now, when your way isn't working. Dad was the youngest of four boys raised in a little village in central Illinois called Tolono. Tolono was an Indian tribe. His father, my grandfather, Lee Eidelman, was a section gang foreman for the Illinois Central Railroad. He ran a crew that employed all four of his sons. And they worked hard during the Great Depression years, swinging picks and sledgehammers 10 hours a day, six days a week, carrying heavy railroad ties, lifting and securing rails in place, back-breaking back -breaking work for a little over a dollar a day. Some of you can identify, you remember those days. Dad and mother, mother married as teenagers and immediately had two little ones in succession, my older sister and my brother. So daily life in those days before I arrived on the scene was a lot of back-breaking work, low pay, cigarettes, 
local tavern on Friday night, limited prospects, and a growing family. With no Christian friends, no church ties, not much of a family life. It did not take long for my dad to conclude that his way wasn't working. And he initiated a change, a literal new way of working. He learned Morse code so he could work inside in an office, first as an operator and then as a dispatcher. A dispatcher, think uh, air traffic controller for trains. And his intentional change made a big difference in the family. It improved his health and the economic security for the family at that time. But as we all know, good health and a more manageable work schedule and improved finances does not necessarily equate to an abundant life. There were still relational challenges flashes of anger, bad language, arguments about money, and only shallow conversations about the daily routine of life and living. I would learn later that my mother had several miscarriages before I and my younger brother came along. I never knew that. I wondered how hard that must have been for them without the support of Christian friends. So, for the first 20 plus years of their 76 years together, my mother and dad had pretty much settled. No talk of feelings, no apologies for offenses, little warmth, few if any professions of love, no Christian music, no bedtime stories and prayers, no counsel about the things that matter most. Church attendance, that was for Christmas and Easter only. But friends, I have a vivid memory of the night that my father initiated another more substantive change, a new way our family would begin working. It was a Tuesday night in February of 1957. A pastor and an elder from the local Church of Christ knocked on our door, and although they were not expected, they were invited in, and they sat with my folks at the dining room table. I was sitting on the floor a few feet away, pretending to be busy, but I was curious, and I listened. And for the first time in my life, I overheard the gospel being presented to my parents. I noticed the expressions on their faces. They were pleasant, but they were also serious. They were hearing about the unconditional love of God and the forgiveness of Jesus and the work of the Holy Spirit to convict of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. I saw the nods of agreement. I saw the bowed heads. I overheard a prayer. And when the men left, my dad announced that come Sunday night, he and my mother were going to be baptized. As a 10-year-old, I was sure that I wanted to be immersed with them. And so it happened. My 38-year-old father, my 36-year-old mother, and their 10-year-old son said yes to Jesus, and things changed. Jesus as Savior and Lord always makes everything new. And I'm telling you, his new way of working, it works. The rest of the story, <laughs> well, a whole new branch was grafted into our family tree. My dad influenced his mother, my grandmother, and all three of his brothers, my uncles, to become Christians. Dad's change would directly impact the lives and the eternal destinies of all four of his children, his 14 grandchildren, and his 32 great-grandchildren. And that is not to mention the many who were blessed by his 40 years as a faithful elder and Bible teacher in two different churches 
in St. Joseph, Illinois and Chicago, Illinois. He was a faithful example to other dads who needed to abandon their way of life that's not working to discover the joy and fulfillment of a new way of working as they intentionally and spiritually lead their families. And it was on Father's Day weekend 12 years ago. We celebrated a very special Father's Day at Crossroads Christian Church in Evansville, Indiana. There were four Eidelman generations on the platform that day. There was my father and me and Kyle and his son, Kale, my grandson. Before Kyle preached, my dad, who was in the last year of his life, played his guitar and sang a song that he considered to be his life theme. It's entitled, Now I Have Everything. Hear the lyrics. I had nothing but heartaches and troubles. I was seeking for fortune and fame. I had nothing but doubts and confusion. But now I have everything. I was making big plans for my future. I was living my lifetime in vain. Then I prayed for life's only meaning. And now I have everything. I have everything I need to make me happy. I have Jesus to show me the way. He has saved me and gave me life eternal. And now I have everything. You do, Dad, and I'll see you again. Um, um, wow, that, uh, I'm grateful for that. I'd love to have my dad pray for the dads. So um, could I just have, if you're a father here, can I go ahead and have you um, stand up? If, if you're at any of our campuses, if, if you'd stand up at your campus, we just as a church family, we'd just love to honor, we'd pray over our dads. Um, so let's take a second, let's honor our fathers. And then dad, would you pray for them? Father God, I am so thankful that you have revealed yourself to us in such powerful ways. Every morning the sun rises and we walk outside and every night when the sun sets and we lay our heads down to rest, we see these reminders of your power and your presence your affection for us to make this beautiful world and put us in the middle of it as the objects of your love and affection and attention. Thank you. And thank you for revealing yourself in the written word, the Bible. There's no book like it. Lord, I just thank you that the paragraph after paragraph are so profound and impactful. If we'll have eyes to see and ears to hear. I thank you most of all you revealed yourself to us in the person of Jesus who said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And we know your temperament. We know your compassion. We know your commitment to what's right and true in the person of Jesus in the pages of the Gospels. Thank you, Father. And I thank you that you've entrusted us as fathers, as heads of households, to be providers and protectors and preservers of our family, to be the spiritual initiators, to be intentional about our leadership by example as well as in word. I pray for every man who's sharing this worship experience tonight to step out, to step up, to move forward in ways that, that are unprecedented in their lives to be able to celebrate what will happen in the lives of the nearest and dearest honor to them as a result. We thank you and praise you for our time together to be reminded of the things that matter most for us as, as dads. In Jesus' name, amen.
the world.